the usual recap, right? So first, let's just remember uh, where we stopped, right? Uh, and then let me tell you a little bit about what's the plan, because today is the final lecture, right? Yeah, uh, so the plan for today is to finish this section about uh, like image processing and basically using convolutional neuronal networks to do so. Uh, in the last lecture, uh, we went into how we can use the usual feed for neuronal networks, right? To analyze uh, image data set. And for that, we played a little bit with the satellite image uh, data set, right? I think it's deep set, the name of this image, the, of this uh, data set. Uh, I know that some of you try to play with that. That's really cool. Uh, and if you have any questions, perhaps uh, that would be a good moment to address that. Uh, did everyone try to analyze to, or at least reproduce the results that we saw in the previous lecture? Any pending questions there? But as we saw, like, uh, because we have been building things step by step, right? So we started like with just simple uh, uh, linear regression based methods, right? Uh, such as logistic regression, supported by two machine. Then we went to perceptron. Then we saw how we can stack perceptrons to solve more complex tasks, right? Which were how we got to multi-layer perceptron or also known as feed forward neuronal networks, right? And then we saw how we can go from using the same type of framework to that we have been using to analyze tabular data, right? Where you have like features and columns and observations in the rows, right? And how we can use that to analyze images by simply like transforming these uh, images, which are matrices, right? To vectors. And then we can feed in the vectors uh, as the input and use exactly the same type of architecture that we have been using so far. Right, so that's essentially what we have seen so far. And then, if you recall, uh, I mentioned that uh, because this data set that we're working with is very simple, right? Like there is no much uh, inputs that come from like geometry that's included in the image, right? Like I could I could very well just try to classify those images according to the colors that I see on them, right? That was one of the things that we saw. So this is a very simple data set. And that's highlighted by, if you go to Kaggle, I think I shared the Kaggle link uh, on uh, Slack as well, where this competition for who designs like a better machine learning based framework to classify those images, you're going to see that like the average performance there is like 9.9, right? So like it's a, it's a very easy data set to, to classify. Uh, very well. Uh, were there any questions uh, until this point? Uh, or yeah, even I have a... Yeah. Sorry. I have a question. So regarding that image matrix, so in this case, we are using 28 into 28 pixel grids, right? So uh, say, for example, I have a, a polygons and uh, the polygons doesn't have like proper square shape 28 into 28. So it has uh, sizes and different shapes. So mm -hmm. is it possible to retain those information? Retain in which sense, you mean? Uh, I mean, use that information as a feature, like the shape of the polygon, instead of just having like a grid. I mean, that's one of the benefits of uh, using convolutional neuronal networks, right? Because you don't necessarily assume a specific shape. And even though if you have a specific shape, let's say that you do want to have your kernel, which is something that I'm going to explain a little bit with a specific shape, right? Uh, you can specify that. Uh, and then we're going to see how you can spe specify this kind of stuff. Uh, but to use, for example, uh, feed for neuronal networks, you see that the input that we feed to the network is just this flattened array, right? So you get like all the information that's contained in either the matrix or the polygon, for example, and you flatten it. So basically, you're saying that the arrangement in 2D is not as meaningful as the information that's contained there, right? And then I think that's going to be highlighted by some of these papers that we're going to discuss in the second half of the lecture as well. Because uh, if you guys got the chance to browse over like the papers that were suggested, you're going to see that they all 
all but one. So like three out of four papers, they are using some sort of like CNN based approach to analyze the data, even for those that have one D input, which is quite interesting. So uh, yeah, does it answer your question? Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Okay. Any other question before we move on? Yeah, um, I was mm -hmm. just wondering, in this case, we just used the, like the spectral values from a satellite image, right? So that's the, the grid, mm. three by three grid uh, that is made into a vector. Or, but it could also be extracted values from any kind of features that we had. Right, yeah. So the first example, the things that we did in the previous lecture, right? Basically, you're just flatten all the information. So like, if you recall the description of the data set, uh, it was 28 by 28 pixels, right? And then it was uh, three channels mm -hmm. plus one, being the three channels, the red, uh, blue, and green, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why we have like a colorful output, plus the infrared information, which probably you guys know that the infrared information is more valuable for like identifying what type of structure or like what type of things are in, in the image. But you guys might know that better than I do, right? So it might be meaningful as well. So, and then what we did was basically to just flatten everything, right? So like all this information, the 28 times uh, three, right? To just uh, be like a flat vector, right? Oh, not, not three, times four, right? Which is exactly the dimension of the input layer, right? So we're just like this considering, assuming that there is no much structure on the way on the arrangement of this input right because that's what we are implying when you say that you can just flatten those images and give that as input but the cnn the convolutional neuronal network uh, assume that there is meaningful information on, on their organization or arrangement of those pixels and the channels right and that's exactly what cnn was meant to address yeah, yeah, I, I get that. I was just wondering if I, if I had a fifth layer with the elevation model or a sixth yes, layer yeah. with texture or yeah. whatever, I could just yeah. add that to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same concept that we, we did for the tree height. Yeah. We were also, okay, over there I had already a vegetation index coming from satellite image and then all the environmental layer. But here the same, you can have the the channel the three three plus one channel from satellite image and all the for example it's very common to put the digital vision model because in flat area you have agriculture for example quite often you know so yes you can adding all the different information and they will be treated perfectly as a number so perfectly the same as a spectral signature so normalization and flatness and so on so perfect in the same way good point Actually, I have worked with previous uh, collaborators that they were using satellite image. Uh, probably was not satellite image, but they had uh, images in different wavelengths. So like they had UV as well, infrared and some other stuff that were meant to, I think was to detect like growth rate of like algae on lakes, you know, something like that. And mm -hmm. in the end, sorry. Yes, well, there are also the hyperspectral satellite yeah. or image that they are, are not more than they actually they arrived to even 60 bands. Right, yeah. So I think they had something like that, like 16 bands. So like, yeah, it was an image with 16 channels. Okay, any other questions? Sebastian, I think we were trying quite a lot, you know? I was actually only um, running the notebook and had some problems with the graphics card, but I solved it now, thanks to Antonio. That was the right. I was aware of the error that they, they are sent to the wrong device, but I wasn't able to solve it myself because I don't know which all these outputs and inputs, it's a little bit complicated. Yeah. No, actually what I did there, uh... Like I'm assuming that most of you are using like simple laptops, right? Uh, although I include the option to run in GPU, I debug it on my own personal laptop, which I by default I leave the GPUs turned off. 
So like it doesn't detect GPUs. So that bug went like undetected by me because the default is to run stuff in on CPU already. So yeah, glad yeah, that my, you found that. In my work, I had uh, I have a very powerful workstation with, with a GPU and of course yeah. it's much more fun to play with that. And um, I can mm -hmm. just, just the cool thing about this Jupyter is that I can, here I'm now sitting in front of my notebook, uh, my laptop, but I can run the code on the, on the mm. workstation and I don't even hear the fan noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, cool, cool. All right, yeah. So if there are no further questions, maybe we start to talk about convolutional neuronal networks then? Or was there any other pending question? Okay, if not, let's start with this. Okay, so finally we get to convolutional neuronal networks then, right? So I feel like we have been talking about convolutional neuronal networks for at least uh, one lecture and a half by now, but I still haven't defined what the convolutional neuronal network is, right? So we had talked initially about the benefits it might bring to analyze image data sets, right? And why is that? So for example, uh, First, why convolutional in the name of these uh, networks, right? So what we have seen before was that uh, one way to analyze image data sets was just by flattening the whole thing, right? But the assumption here is that basically, ideally, right? Each one of these features, which were initially pixels, right? Each one of these features now, uh, they are independent, right? which when you're dealing with image data sets, uh, we know very well that that's not very much the truth, right? So for example, you might have like a cluster of pixels, right? That are designed or specifying or representing to some extent a structure, right? Let's say that you do have, for example, like in the satellite image that we have, let's move here. You have like these uh, very straight lines, right? that they might be meaningful when you're trying to identify a road or for example, just the edge of a building, right? Which is this case here that we, have, we are observing, right? And if you have such thing, you might want your neuronal network to be capable of detecting such uh, organizational patterns, right? Because that might be helpful for you when you're trying to perform a classification, for example, right? If you see that there are straight lines, most likely you're not like getting an image from a forest or uh, ocean, right? Most likely you're getting something that's man-made because you don't have that many straight lines in nature uh, most often, okay? So, uh, and that's exactly the type of things that the convolutional neural networks, they are meant to target, right? So for example, now the input most often is gonna be something that looks like a tensor, right? And for those of you who don't know what's a tensor, uh, the tensor is, uh, a matrix that has more than two dimensions. So like if you have just a, a matrix, right? That could be a tensor of dimension two. But when you have like 3D matrices, then it already has a specific name, which is a tensor, right? And then you can have a tensor that has as many dimensions as you want, okay? And what would be those dimensions? That That's very relative, right? So for example, you could uh, RGB, image, right, which basically are these three color channels, but you could also have one more dimension, which could be like time. Let's say that you're taking like a time lapse image, like over the same location, right, uh, over time. So that's one more dimension that we have there. But that's just to give an example, but I'm pretty sure you can think of several other data sets that have, might have several dimensions in, in that aspect, okay? And then how it works. So for example, when you're defining your convolutional neuronal network, usually you're convolving, and that's why we had this convolutional in the name, right? Convolving the input with a specific kernel, okay? And what is the kernel? You can think of the kernel as a filter that's looking for patterns that look like the specifications of the filter, okay? So let me see if I include one example here. Okay, so those are like few kernels that usually they are used, right? So for example, those are the kernels that were uh, uh, designed 
or you can also learn those kernels, right? According to the way how you set up your uh, convolutional neuronal network to detect all the sorts of things. So these one were the kernels that were used by uh, a very famous convolutional neuronal network uh, model called AlexNet when trying to train on a data set that has like natural image, okay? That's called ImageNet and was used for many, many years as some sort of benchmark to try to compare different uh, convolutional neuronal networks approach, okay? And the AlexNet was like the best performance uh, uh, convolutional neural network-based model for many years uh, until like more modern things such as ResNet and Inception, which are two models that we're gonna discuss later on, they uh, came to exist. Okay, so a few things that here probably you notice is that like some of these kernels, which are filters that you're going to use to convolve with your image, they have very uh, interesting shapes, right? So for example, if you observe those first kernels here, they sort of have like these white bands that are making a sandwich with a black band, okay? The white band would be perhaps like once, in the black band, they could be zeros, right? So what happens? When you're convolving your image with these uh, kernels, right? You're performing this operation. Uh, here we have another example. Uh, this one is not moving, but like you're convolving this image with this kernel, right? So you see that you have ones and zeros on it. So whenever you have a one, that means that you want to highlight that feature that you have in the original image, right? So for example, when would you have like maximum activation for that kernel? Whenever you have a region of the image that exactly match the features of the kernel, right? So for example, for a kernel that looks like that, if you have a straight line or like a road, for example, you'd have maximum activation when this kernel is being covolved with that specific region of the image that contains a road or like the edge of a building. You see what's the rationale here? Okay. So if you have maximum activation for that region, this kernel would be like maximally, act, maximally activated and downstream in the network that should come like as uh, to the final node where the decision is gonna be made, either for a regression or a classification as we have seen before, that information should propagate through the network and be very meaningful. We're gonna try to classify that image, okay? So the rationale is the same. The difference is that now, instead of like looking at features uh, isolated, right? Now we are looking into like 2D uh, patterns. All right. Uh, and then you see Anna, that. Mm -hmm. One question. Uh, when this kernel, most of them, or almost all of them, they are, they, you can follow a pattern, a directional pattern, let's say. Okay. Like directional the, pattern. Like the one that you mentioned, that is the first one. Okay. Okay. You can see in that direction and so on, all the other, more or less. There is no. So, what does it mean that they are able to capture feature only in that particular direction? Correct. That's why you have filters that have slightly different directions, you see? Uh, you can select more than one. You have to select more than one. No, you, usually those uh, More filters one, that yeah. we're going to learn is something that you define when you're setting up the uh, convolutional neuronal network that we're going to use, okay. right? So you can. So for example, more. yeah, we're okay. going to see when exactly we define. So for example, in this first convolutional layer that was being used by the AlexNet, they had nine, six filters, you see? And all these filters, uh, the ImageNet data set is like images that are... 256 by 256 pixels and they have three channels, right? And each one of these filters, they are smaller. So like they are pretty much the way how you're observing here. So you see that that's the uh, dimension of the image. And that's like the size of the filter that's being used here, right? For, the, for this data set, the filter was 11 by 11 compared to like the whole image, which is 256 by 256, right? In each one of these filters, they were detecting something different. So you see that like you have several for shape, like mainly straight lines, right? Uh, you have some for colors, as you can observe here, right? And in some cases, you also have like circular patterns, which uh, here I'm not seeing any, but like in, if circular patterns, they are also meaningful. Usually you see that you have like, uh, bright spot that's surrounded by black and also the other way around, okay? For example, here you have like one of these 
like kind of diagonal patterns, right? But yeah, you, you might have like several different types of uh, filters that you can use to detect. Okay, thanks. Can you can you, anyone pointing what is remind this kind of kernels in satellite techniques and image processing? Anyone an idea? Yeah, we have local image operations. And we use these for kernels for smoothing, uh, yes, blur yes. blurring, sharpening, and stuff. That's also Perfect. called convolution, I think. Perfect. All this kind of filtering that we use in image processing for texture analysis, for example, in remote sensing, age detection, they are perfectly the same. You try to bring the information from the other pixel to the local pixel focus, and you try to understand the local pattern around that pixel, okay? Um, yeah, that, that's actually a pretty interesting comment uh, because uh, this type of patterns that you see here, they have uh, this family of patterns, they have a name that's called uh, Gabor filters, right? And among the Gabor filters, some of them are very common. For example, the blurring operation that you, uh, Sebastian was talking about, it's one of the operations that are part of the Gabor filters uh, family. So it, it's interesting to see that those things, although they are being used by AlexNet, right? By convolutional neuronal networks, they only got this label as being part of like or implementing empirically Gabor filters uh, in the uh, after like 2012. And the Gabor filters, they're like from the 80s or even earlier than that, right? So like people conclude that like, oh yeah, actually convolutional neural networks can uh, generate something that looks like Gabor filters. So yeah. Okay. Right, so essentially we, we have seen already what the kernels are, right? And how they convolve the image in order to detect those patterns, okay? So besides that, right? So like here we have seen so far just how it would operate in one single channel, right? But we know that each image, for example, the ones that we have been working with, they might have several channels. So how would that work for several channels? So here we have an image. Let me try to move this to the other side, okay. So here we have an image that now has uh, three channels, okay? And now we are gonna convolve with like two filters, which we are calling the W0 and W1, okay? Each one of these filters has a different uh, specification with respect to pattern, right? So you see like some ar arrangement of zeros, minus one and one, okay? So you see that each one of these filters they have their own uh, channel arrangement as well, okay? So this multiplication is like a filter across different regions, right, of the image. And this is done simultaneously, simultaneously for all the channels, okay? So that's what you're observing here. So just as we were doing before, Right, these filters now they represent the set of weights that we want to learn. Okay, so like that's very similar to what we have done in the feed for neuronal network. If you think about that, right? Essentially, those are the the features, right? Those are the the uh, features of our input. Okay, and those are the weights that we're trying to learn in order to maximize an outcome for this network. Being this outcome, either a classification of an input image or just like a simple regression, like as like canopy height or any other thing or like depth estimation, for example, right? So like th this is exactly the same thing that we are doing before. What we're gonna do is play with these weights, right? Here, the weights, they, they uh, represent the filters that we're gonna learn in order to maximize uh, our outcome or like minimize a loss as well, okay? So you see that like those filters that we're learning, they are specific to the task that we're trying to solve, okay? So these patterns, these patterns, right? They were meaningful for an image classification task being those images like natural images, so like pictures of stuff, okay? But the filters that you might learn for your task, they might look very different because they are meant, like they are optimized to solve your task, okay? Very well. And how does it work? So like 
here we have a, a matrix multiplication, right? Between this region of the image and the filter, okay? So if you do this matrix multiplication, right? It's a pointwise multiplication. It's not like a, a dot product or anything. If you do this multiplication in sum, all the values that you have, that's what you get for a specific region uh, on the output, okay? So for example, here we have this kernel that's being covalved with this uh, image, right? Uh, uh, another thing as well, you see that you have zeros like on the borders, right? Those zeros, they are uh, artificially added, right? Like that's something that you can ask to do while you're designing your convolution uh, layer, right? Because for example, if you, you have to convolve this image with this kernel, that's three by three, right? And you don't have uh, padding, what would happen is that your starting point would be this block here. Can you see that, right? So like things that are in the edge, like or the border of the image, they would be basically discarded, right? So if you do want your uh, uh, your filter, your kernel to start at the very first pixel, you need to add this uh, padding that we call with zeros. Can everyone see that? So that's something that else you can define. So for example, if you don't do that, most often you're gonna get zeros on the edges of your uh, output after you do the convolution, okay? And uh, as you can see, we have one value that's generated by blocks of nine pixels here, right? And that's what you get here, okay? So, so far we have covered like two things, which like the importance of the kernel, right? How this operation is done, right? Because like that's just the multiplication and also the padding, right? Which is like this extra feature that's usually defined when you're designing uh, your convolution neuronal network. Okay. Any questions so far before we go into more details of like what's the padding and now what's the pooling operation? Uh, why, I hope why is it so small, the output? This output? Yeah. Should be like the same size of the input, right? Uh, no, right? Because like what you're trying to do is to go from image space to something that looks like either a single number, right? Which like, let's say that we are doing a regression. So we just want a single output or very few nodes that represent classes, right? So for example, our input is, uh, let's say an image of 1000 by 1000 pixels. We want as output of that network, either one single value, so one node or very few nodes. Let's say that we have 10 classes that we're trying to classify. So we would have just 10 nodes. So you see that we're doing like this downscaling of like number of features all the way to zero, right? Uh, not to zero, to, to either one or very few, you see? So that's something okay. that I was going to describe. Yeah. That's not a spatial relationship here. It's on purpose to make it smaller, okay. Yeah, yeah, because that's the goal, right? Like we yeah. want like to classify uh, yeah, the input right. in I very see. few nodes or just one perhaps, right? So you see that you usually have like this uh, downscaling of spatial resolution all the way to something that looks like that, right? Which I was going to get to later, but uh, it's important that you realize that there is this like kind of cone shape in the way how you're downscaling the number of features that you have, okay? Uh, I think there was one more question. Uh, yes. And what happens if there isn't a filter for the task that you want to do? Or is there a filter there is what? Sorry? for every task? Is there a filter for every task? Or are there tasks? If there is a filter for every task. The yeah. kernel. kernel. The kernel, yeah. So these kernels, they are learning in order to make the best use of the data that you have and approximate the target right so like what does it mean that those kernels they are going to be optimized for a specific task and when you say if there is a future for every task essentially that's the assumption that we had before right that's like the perceptrons uh or the nodes of a neuronal network they are meant to solve any type of task in theory, right? Based on like Newton's uh, observation is that like they are universal computational engines, right? 
So in fear, they should be able to find a set of filters, right? If you're talking about specifically convolutional neuronal networks, a set of filters that are going to be helpful or meaningful for you to go from image space to target, right? If they are meaningful visually, maybe that's what you mean, right? If they are meaningful visually, that's something that's very abstract. For example, would you say that this filter is meaningful? It's hard to tell, right? Because like, it's just like a mix between green bands and red bands. But like in the scheme of like how to go from all images in the image net to like classes, it might be meaningful, right? And that's essentially what this neuronal network's doing. Well, was that your question or you meant something different? I, yeah, no, I wasn't sure if you first learn the kernel based mm -hmm. on the on what you feed the model, and then you predict on new images. Is that right? Oh yeah, it is exactly the same scheme that we have been using so far, okay. right? You learn the the kernels, which are nothing else than the weights, right, of our neuronal network, and then like if you want to see how that would perform in like completely unseen data set, then you have your test set, which you use to just make this type of inference. So we don't need to know something about these kernels. They are created on the during the process, right? The, I mean, the the machine yeah. is creating the kernels. We don't have to give it to the machine. Let's say not in convolutional and, neural network because this is totally different to this regular image processing where you have to mm -hmm. design your kernels by yourself. I think that's a little bit confusing. Confusing. No, yeah, exactly. And you're completely right. Uh, there are things that, for example, you can uh, do if you're expecting the things to follow a specific type of organization, right? So, for example, you can give a pre-trained set of weights, which are like these pre-trained filters, right? And many applications, many papers are going to use that. I think even one of the papers that you guys recommended, they use pre-training on ImageNet, which is essentially those filters, right? So they use those filters as, as a starting point. And some of them, they do some fine tuning. So like you provide those as the initialization, the initial state of the neuronal network, and you, and you let your neuronal network to be refined with that as your starting point. Because if you don't do that, as we have seen before, the initialization is just like a uniform distribution for the weights in the neuronal network, which should be just like random noise, right? And then after several iterations, you're going to find filters that are like, you start to pick on specific patterns, right? But if you do that as a, your starting point, your training is going to be much faster, right? And that might be also uh, more helpful for like finding a, a better like uh, solution for your problem overall. And yeah, like compared to the usual image process techniques, like the Sobin filter, like this kind of this kind of the Gaussian filter for like blurring operations, there you have kernels that have very specific shapes, like from from the beginning. That's correct. Any other questions? Okay, so now we have discussed very briefly about the padding, right? which like essential if you want to also give you emphasis to like things that are very close to the edge of the image, right? Another thing that's very important as well, it's the pooling operation, right? So like from the output that you obtain that usually already has like a smaller uh, spatial resolution than the input that you fed, right? Because like, let's remember that that's essentially what we're doing, right? So you have like a small kernel that you use to convolve with your original image. Then you obtain as output, like a tensor that has less number of like, uh, not pixels because that's no longer pixels, but like less number of elements in X and Y. And it's just deeper now in number of uh, channels, right? Because those number of channels are things that you decide when you say how many filters you want to use uh, to convolve your image, right? So like the number of channels is essentially the number of filters that you, you want to uh, train. Okay, so if you want more filters to be used, that's necessarily increasing the, the depth of this tensor. Okay, uh, which is something that doesn't really matter much because in the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to go from image space to something that's sort of gonna look like just a vector in the end, right? As you can observe here. And then at this point, you're gonna use the classic feed for neural neural network right, which here is like fully connected, right, to uh, project those numbers to something that like rem reminds you of classes or like a single node that's for a regression, okay. 
But until this point, what we're doing is try to increase the number of uh, 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 channels, right? Which is this depth uh, that are proportional to the number of kernels that we're using and decrease the 2D arrangement. My cat. Okay. And Antonio, one question. So uh, in the end, let's say that our input, they were the car and you have mm -hmm. the bands in the three bands of the car. Then you decide the, the kernel size, let's say this three by three. Mm -hmm. uh, this three by three, that it should be this one, no? Three by three. This one. Can you see my... Ah, yeah, I can see that, yeah. yeah I mean, so the size then... of the kernel, it's up to you, right? So for example, for yeah. ImageNet, they use 11 by 11. 11 by 11, okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then can you go back to the... Mm -hmm. So then you identify one number that represented the feature in the 11 by 11. And so right. on, you do it for all the pixels. Mm -hmm. That's and correct. And you keep, you keep doing the same operation. So in the end, you will have the three bands, original, so this one, mm -hmm. plus each one that give us information about the look the response around The it. response to the future. To yeah. the response of the field to the surrounding. So in the end, yeah. we will have three, four, five, six, seven, eight feature, correct? So three, four, five. That, that, that this depth depends on how many filters you had, right? So for yeah. example, so in this case, yeah. yeah. So for example, I had how many filters here? I had nine, six filters, like for the image net, oh, right? Okay. So it takes us from like RGB, right? Red, blue, and green to nine, six, you see? It's very long. Yeah. So it's adding 96 layers. Right. Okay. Which is like the response to each one of the filters that were used. Yeah, each one is one field. Yeah. Okay, okay. And each filter is all of them that we you show before the, each single kernel. All yeah, that, those are all the filters. Yeah, that were used. Uh, okay, so we don't need to pre-select some in particular. They are the default. No, those are learned, right? They are optimized. So those are the yeah. weights of your neuronal network. So like they are going to be optimized. You can use that as your starting point. As I was mentioning before, several applications do. They don't start like from random filters. They start from something that already has an organization pattern, and then they just refine those. So like they just like do small modifications to these uh, filters that are already uh, uh, known to be like a good starting point, better than random, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you remove the lines? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I was trying. I was trying. Yeah. Clear, all, clear yeah. Okay. I think it's gone. All right. Yeah. I yeah. have a question. Like, mm -hmm. for example, we have 96 filters. Does it mean right. that each of those filters will have information or some of them will be empty? It's very difficult for you to have empty filters, right? And can anyone guess why that would be the case? Based on what we have discussed about, like, these... Uh, Maybe. tendons or thing that we want to enforce on the neuronal networks with respect to the weights, how the weights are distributed. Because you always have pixel value. Okay, Alonso, you go back to the image, huh? Tony. But that's not the answer. <laughs> oh, okay. But that's not the answer, no. <laughs> because we don't have like zero yeah Sorry. because we're we're not gonna get zero right and why was that let me find that slide you guys remember the regularization techniques that we had this right so what would imply that you have like a, the filters are the weights as i just described to you right they are just considered filters because they have a specific 2D organization, but they are essentially weights, right? So it, would I have uh, a zero weight in my learned uh, weights 
not necessarily right because like the network's trying to get something that looks like that right like so the network's like being forced to learn meaningful or like greater than zero ways right because uh for several reasons like we enforce this kind of weight distribution because we want the model to be the, the loss to be convex right and by being convex i hope by now you guys are tired of listening to me saying that like convex is good because that ensures you that you're uh you have fewer number of like uh local minimums and because you have fewer number of local minimums more likely for you to guide to find the global minima right and that's one of the reasons why your 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 network's going to be forced to find meaningful uh kernels which is like what one of you said that like you're not going to get zeros for weights i mean if the filter would be zero then it would be probably dropped right i mean we wouldn't like to work with such a filter but it's not going to be zero right the network it's forced to not find a zero filter like by using both the weight regularization and the dropout technique that I described in the previous lecture, right? Because it's like, if you have one filter that's zero, at some point you're gonna find that uh, the other nodes are gonna be dropped, right? And then the nodes that were uh, left to be used for prediction, they have to be meaningful because now I don't have that much information available anymore right so like that's a way how you force the the filters or the weights of this network now to be meaningful so like they are not going to be zero but that's a, a good question thanks uh, so i have a question so in the mm -hmm. car uh image example you showed uh yeah so the mm -hmm. model takes only like one part of the car, right? So will it continue to take every part of the car and try to find it? Right. Yeah, because that filter is going to be convolved with the whole image, right? Exactly like you're, you're seeing here. So like imagine that now this green matrix represents the image of the car. So you see mm -hmm. that that filter is like being convolved with the whole image, right? So like all the parts of the car are going to be scanned. Got it. And and if we have like so, car can have a different size, and uh, other thing have can have a different size, and the model will find uh, all that. We don't need to give anything particularly for that. Now the things that you have to define are usually like how big is this kernel, right? So for example, we define the size of this kernel and how many filters you want to use, like how many kernels you want to use. Right, so those are things that you you can set as like hyperparameters for the convolutional neural now network. Oh, got it. Thank you. Okay, so like there are some some things that you have to account for, right? So for example, if you're using really big kernels, then you're looking for like things that are major, right? So for example, in this case, right, with a kernel that's this big, you're gonna be able to catch like corners of the 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 curvature of the car, right? You'll be able to detect whole wheels. If this kernel was even bigger than that, like the type of things that you'd be able to identify is like structures that are like massive already, so like half of a car, right? And then one thing that like has been proved mathematically is that like the bigger the kernel, more specific it is for your application. And most often you get like overfitting, right? So like your your uh, your kernels, they're just gonna be used or like effectively trained to identify things that are part of a very narrow type of like uh, data, right? So like probably it would be useful set of kernels or the fut filters to classify cars and nothing else. Right, which is not something desirable for like a data set like ImageNet because it has pictures of all sorts of things, flowers, cars, school buses, and like buildings and so on. Okay, any other question? All right, so we have defined so far the kernel, right? Which is like what we use to convolve the image. We have defined also the padding, which like these zeros that we add to the borders, right? Because that also helps us to also focus on like things that are close to the edge in case that they are meaningful, okay? And there is one more operation that usually it's used to speed up the process of like narrowing the number of features that you have like in 2D uh, and get to like closer and closer to these uh, very long 
uh, array that's going to be used later on to feed in this fully connected component of the CNNs most often, right? And this operation is called max pooling or pooling general because you can use different types of pooling. What does it do? Okay. So for example, after you did the convolution, okay, let's say that you obtain something that looks like that, right? So like you went from like image space, that was something here, right? That image space now has something that looks like that, for example, right? So like it's a, now you have a lower spatial resolution, but it's deeper because that's the number of filters that we use to convolve with, right? And one thing that people do at this point is to just say that you want to not take the whole information that was given as output of the first convolutional layer, but you want to summarize that even further, right? So for example, let's say that this is the output of the first convolutional layer, right? Here looks a little different, but you can assume that was exactly the output that we're getting here, okay? So that was exactly the result of the convolution of the first convolutional layer. So here, what they do is like, okay, now I'm gonna set a size for my max pooling and like whatever I have within that uh, block, right? Or like that portion, I'm gonna summarize as just being either the mean of those the values that I have within that uh, region that I'm some trying to summarize, or uh, the maximum value, right? So, for example, here we are summarizing this tensor now, right, as just being like the maximum value that I have for that specific region. So, for example, the maximum value for that specific region is six. So you see the six here. The maximum value that I have for this region is eight, and so on, right? And what's the, the consequence of doing so? For example, if you have something that looks like that as the result of the first convolutional layer, right? If, you're tr if your goal, because the goal in the end is trying to just like extract as much meaningful features as you can in order for you to get to this single vector that you're gonna use to pass through the fully connected layer, which is later on gonna give you like either a single value or like uh, 10 classes, right? you might be able to speed up this process by using the max pooling. So for example, here we went from this uh, uh, 224 by 224 tensor to 112 by 112. And you see that like most of the arrangements, things that were like contained on, in this image that was like higher resolution, if you will, is, are still contained here, but just lower resolution. And most often that already suffices for you to be able to extract these features that you're looking for. Uh, for the downstream application, okay? So that's also something that you see very often like in applications in general that are using uh, convolutional neuronal networks. And like all the papers that you guys suggest, they all use max pooling as well. So you're gonna see that that's also present there. All right, very well. So this is just like this summarization. We have been go going back and forth to these slides. So probably by now, you know, all the components that you have there, right? But that's the network that was used. So that's the AlexNet, okay? That's the AlexNet that I showed to you guys before. So those are the type of, of images that are given by input as input to the AlexNet. So like there were uh, uh, several samples of images that were taken like from the internet in general, right? And what the way how it was designed is that would have like an initial convolutional layer that would learn these 96 filters that we have discussed before, okay? And they would scan the image like little by little, right? And then they would generate those figures, right? The output of this, uh, uh, of the first convolutional layer, right? Was then passed through the uh, ReLU. So ReLU is the activation function that we have seen before, right? So you see that even these uh, activation functions that we have explored like extensively for feed for neuronal networks, they're still being used for convolutional neuronal networks. So like whatever is the output of this convolution, again, the convolution is just like the multiplication of the input by a set of weights that are being learned. So like those are exactly the same terms that we have been dealing with for the perception and for the feed for neuronal network. So it are exactly the same thing. This output needs to go through an activation function. So like the, pref the preference for like a activation function in neuronal networks are usually ReLU. And that's the one that we have been using the most, right? For like hidden layers and stuff, right? 
This is followed by a, a pooling operation. So that's this strategy that you can use to try to shrink down the spatial arrangement of your input even faster, right? Because like you don't need that high resolution in this step. And then you repeat usually this procedure by like another stack of convolutional layer in ReLU, another pooling operation. Then you can do that as many times as you want, right? And you're gonna see that like, some people they use like 50 of those layers like in combination right so like you do like more gradual uh, decrease of the uh, spatial information uh, all the way until you finally get something that looks like just a single array right and when you get to the single array then you use exactly the same feed forward network arrangement that we saw in the previous lectures right until you finally get the output that you're looking for, which is either one single node for regression or like a binary classification or as many nodes as classes that you have in your data set. Okay, that might be a lot of information to process. So please let me know if you have any questions about the usual arrangement of convolutional neural networks. I, I, the only things that I want you to keep in mind, it's like the definition of a kernel, which is this filter that we use, right? Uh, the uh, the usage of this padding because like that's something that's also uh, very important depending on like how this uh, input information that you're providing is organized. If you don't have meaningful information in the in the borders, you might just like not need padding at all. Uh, and the pooling operation, which is also very important. Okay. And at this part here, that those are the things that we have seen like over and over again during the feed forward neural network sessions of the class. All right, any questions? There is one more thing that I, I didn't mention, but for example, in this example here, right? You see that we are moving like sideways one by one, right? So like, you see that you're just like moving one column like to the right and one row every time, right? You can also change the way how you do this uh, scanning to be like every two cells instead. So for example, instead of moving one sideways, right? The way how it's happening here, you might do bigger jumps, okay? That's also something that people do in order to minimize the size of the output of the convolutional layer as well. Because then if you just do like every two, right? you'd have one and then two here, right? So like you'd have this as being the first element and then the second element would be already this one here, right? So like the output of that would be just a two by two instead of a three by three, right? And then instead of like having to use max pooling operations like this one, you might as well just do like bigger jumps like which people usually refer to as they stride, right? So like, that's also something else that uh, some people use, although it's less uh, commonly used because there is a trade-off, right? If you do bigger jumps, let's say that like, uh, turns out that in this region here, there was something that you wanted to identify, right? You might just miss that if you do these bigger jumps. So that's also something that you need to, to consider. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, no, no. And uh, so all these para new parameters, let's say we will need to define. Which so will dimension, be yeah. dimension of the window, how many cells you need to skip. The 96 mm -hmm. is fixed. The 96 kernel. As far as the convolution. It's, it's what? It's fixed. We don't need to say they calculate all the 96. No, you choose that as well. Like they use nine six, but you you might want to use just mm -hmm. ten, uh, or you okay. might want to, to want to use like two thousand, right? And then the party and the pooling. The, the pooling is something to reduce even more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, those are all hyperparameters that you you define when you're designing your network, and then we're gonna see some of that now. Okay. Okay. Okay, so maybe we go back here, right? So like, let's see how we define the convolutional neuronal network now. Okay, so here, that's the code that I, I use for this very simplistic uh, convolutional neuronal network, right? So here, 
Before what we had was just the FCs, right? Which were the fully connected. And I hope you're familiarized with those, right? Now we have something a little different because now we also have the two deconvolutional layers, okay? And how is that defined now? So the first parameter that you define is the input of like in terms of number of channels that you have for your input, okay? So remember that before was the number of features that we had, right? So like, oh, my data is 2D because before you were just using X and Y, so it was just two. Then we went to use 20 because the, those are all the number of features that we had in the three high data sets, right? And now you're using four. What's the, the four here? Assume, uh, given that we're using the satellite image data set. The dimension? The red, green, and blue, and the infrared. In, in infrared, that's correct. Those are the channels that you had in the data set. The output is the number of channels that I'm going to have in this thing here, right? Those are the channels that are like the output channels. And we said that these output channels, they were something very specific. What was that? What was conditioning the depth of the output of the convolutional layer? Number of kernels. Number of kernels. So you see that this parameter is the number of kernels. OK? Now, the next parameter, let me open the, the torch definition of this. Yeah. In case you want to get more details. OK, so the first parameter is the number of input channels. The second one is output channels, which is also the number of kernels, right? And then you say, what's the kernel size next, right? What's the kernel size that you're using here? It's 5, right? So like if we are using the AlexNet uses 11 by 11. The uh, toy example that I showed to you guys here we, was using three by three, and now you're using five by five to the satellite image data set, which is reasonable, right? Because the dimensionality, like pixel wise, is 28 by 28. Okay. And then there is one more parameter that we haven't defined, which is like what's the stride, right? By default, the stride is one. So like you're just moving like one pixel sideways every time that we do the, the moving, right? The dimensionality of the padding. So I told you that like if you don't put anything, right, you're most likely discarding the things that are on the border of the image, which I, I'm willing to take the risk. <laughs> I, I don't want you to consider things that are too close to the border, right? Uh, and then you have some other operations, for example, the bias, right? Uh, the bias is like this constant that you add to all the, the, the filters, right? Uh, by default is, uh, is set to true. So for example, I'm going I might have to I'm, I might have the option to learn some uh, offset, right? That's just gonna uh, impact the output of all the outputs of the uh, kernels, right? So that's just a bias. And what else we have here? Device, blah blah blah. So for example, you might set directly in which device you're gonna have your thing. So like you don't need to do it manually like uh, Sebastian had to do. So you, you might define directly here as well. Okay, good. So I think we have defined all the parameters that we need for the convolutional 2D layer, right? So like this now is fully defined. So like that we, we know all the operations that we want to do. So next is the max pooling 2D, right? That I, I defined to you guys here, right? So like how I'm going to uh, aggregate the information that I have from the output of the convolutional layer. So here I'm using a two by two, OK? So the first two is the size of this kernel. So it's exactly the way how you're showing here. And the next two is the stride. So like you see that like here we had a kernel two with stride two. So that's exactly what we're doing, OK? So that's the kernel two for the max pooling. So I'm going to use like two by two, right? And I'm going to summarize that as being just the maximum value that I have in, in that uh, window, right? So like, that's exactly what we saw here, right? And then I'm going to move two pixels to the other side and redo this operation. And that's essentially what the colors are defined. So that's the first block here and the second block after I move with stride two. Good, any questions? 
Then I'm going to repeat this operation, right? For the second convolutional layer. So like we did this first operation, convolutional, right? Pulling. And now I'm going to do the second operation, the second convolutional uh, operation, which here is the conv2, right? So as we saw before, the first one, it's input channels. The input channels are still six, right? And now I'm going to say how many output channels I want. So like how many filters I have for the second convolutional layer? Sorry again, uh, Antonio, last question. How many? Yeah, how many filters I have for the second convolutional layer? 16. According to 16, right? So and six, now 16. Yeah, what's the kernel size? Five, five, right? It's tried. Okay, so we are identify each single block. Each okay. single block. Yeah, the image of the the car image. We are identify each single dimension of this block. Yeah, but we are no longer in the car uh, space, right? We are already here, which yeah, yeah. like this. Yeah. Yeah. Block. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This block. Yeah. Then, Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we are we are dealing with this volume now, which like it's already like a combination of the features that we had, right? So like it's something abstract now. It's an abstract representation of a car. Good. Yeah. So like everything else is default. Like so the stride was one, right? So like we moved sideways uh, one position every time. The padding was the still zero and so on, right? After we have done that, now we get to the fully connected layers, right? Which is this part here, okay? So what we do? So here at this point, the output of this layer, right? Is gonna be a 16 by four by four. So like the 2D part of this image, uh, of this representation is now two by two by 16. Oh God, okay, by 16, right? And now what we're gonna do is to flatten that as just one array, right? Which we know we can do. Before what you're doing, if you guys remember, right? In the beginning, we we're just flattening the whole image. It's still in the image space that was 28 by 28 by four, just flatten that and then passing it through a fully connected layer, right? A fully connected network. Now at least you're extracting features, like accounting for like this 2D spatial organization. We assume that in this part is like the future learning, right? So like we're extracting these meaningful features that might have might be well represented in a 2D organization. And then with these learned features that were learned by this, the CNN, now we do the usual feed for neural neural network. Okay. So like now we get the usual linear layers. Okay. So this now the input dimension, right? Which like number of channels by x and y that you have in this tensor and that's the output to my hidden right so like my hidden now is 120 then 120 to like the output of this hidden like 84 for example could be anything as we have seen could be 120 again and then the input which like has to match this one right i hope you guys have observed that there is such pattern right like the output of one layer has to be the dimension of the output of the other layer and then finally to six so what is this final layer doing for me why is it six it's the output layer with six different classification categories yeah because i had six classes right so that's that's why that one is six so those guys they're all hidden dimensions right as we have seen and this is the one that's matching like the in number of input channels that I have, which were four. So like everything else here can be considered as hidden, right? The hidden layers, they just have like different organizations. Okay. Any questions until here? Why is it 16 times four by four again? I didn't get that. Yeah, so that was the number of channels that I have after the first convolutional layer. Yes. Right? So like now I have 16 and then this volume it's like it's going to be the consequence of like the combination between the stride and kernel size, right? For this combination of strides in kernel size that we have set, the 
dimension of this tensor that we have here is two, is four by four by 16. Because it's five okay. minus one. Because we have the border, right? Or is that? No, no, that, that's gonna depend on like, for example, let me go back to this image, right? So for example, you see that like for this input size of image in this kernel, we went from this five by five to three by three, right? And then I told you that like, for example, if I was using stride two, it would be just two by two, right? right. So turns out that like, according to my combination of like kernel size and stride that I defined here, right? The output's gonna be four by four. How do you know? Actually, there is a formula, uh, which I okay. probably should. Yeah, I, I, but you can do that. Well, but theory. isn't, isn't yeah. there a way to do that automatically? I mean, the, the, that's pretty calculatable. So why, why is this? It, it is, yeah, it, it is calculatable. Yeah, but the thing is that, for example, for this system, after I do that, for example, right, I can I still include the max pooling layer, which there is no way for the system to know that I decide to add the max pooling layer, right? So I still need to define those things because like I might just do a different operation. But, but there. there is a way to look into the output of the of the third layer, let's say. Yeah, and I usually do. Yeah. So for yeah, example, okay. here, uh, I, I never calculate those things like by hand. What I do is like, okay, after I get here, I do a print right. X point shape. shape. <laughs> and yeah, then like yeah, I see what I mean. what's the yeah. shape and I just define it here. Ah, yeah, okay. like, that's what I usually do. Yeah. And another question, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So we saw that you could visualize these filters in the of the first convolution. So yeah. how, do, how do the filters look for the second convolution? Are they visualizable? And they have so many dimensions, it's probably, but you could be do a PCA or something. Uh, they, they are readily available to you as like in the image space, just the way how people plotted this, right? Yeah. So like you have like uh, 16, uh, sorry, nine, six filters that they have, uh, where was that thing? Yeah, so for example, this is a stack of like 2D matrices, if you will, right? Not, not a stack of nine, six filters. So you can visualize each one of those as individual images, which is essentially what we're doing here, right? So like, and then they have a very intuitive representation, right? But the thing is that, for example, in the after the, the first convolutional layer, you still have something that re reminds you like of simple patterns. After the second convolutional layer, now they are combination of like abstract features. So they no longer look like anything to you, right? Okay. Yeah, so like the, the first convolutional layer, they might still learn something that's it's like in interpretable, right? But after the second convolutional layer is just whatever helps the network with like con combining features of the input. But there is usually a second layer or in, in complexer cases. Oh, for example, ResNet, and inception net, right? Which are like variations of simple CNNs. I think one has 52 and the other has like hundreds of convolutional layers. So okay. that's what, what people play yes. with then. Uh, so they are just the yeah. whole time You're... trying different layers and... Yeah, it's like, it's the curse of deep nets, right? Like the deeper, more powerful you make your, your model, yeah. But as long as you have resource to train something like that. Antonio, one, one point. When we you set up the 16, you set up, uh, yeah, in yeah. the code, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you set up the 16 kernel. Mm -hmm. okay, but, but which one of the 96 is not one? So again, right? 96 was the value that the Alex net designers decide to use right yeah. but you can use as many as you want so like if i wanted to use 1000 kernels I, I can do that right what they're gonna learn is a different story right but like I, I can use as many kernels as i want so for example here i decide to use six for the first one so instead of 96 i have just six right for the first convolutional layer right so like mm -hmm. in comparison to these guys i would have just like six Ah, which might or may not look like this, but I'll just so, have six. So the first six, no. Yeah, N not the first six, could be anything, 
right? Like th this is what AlexNet learned, but like by no means that's what I'm gonna learn as well. Maybe I learned something that's different. What is Alex trained on? Is it also satellite imagery or is it more like uh, something? It was the image net, right? Which like pictures of all the sorts of things, cars, school buses, trees. So objects like natural images. Or, or yeah, natural right. images of, yeah. of our world, let's say, or of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So not satellite imagery. No, not satellite image. That could be okay. one task to plot or to uh, visualize the our filters from the satellite imagery yeah i think your paper the paper that you did you suggested the deep map actually they show the filters that were learned there so we're gonna get there okay all right in, any questions uh, any further questions uh, i'm very happy that you guys are asking questions that, that's a good thing Yeah, I was okay. just wondering about the other numbers you choose, 120 and 84, or what it was. Are they random or more or less? <laughs> this? Yeah. No, yeah, 120 and then 84 in the next. Are they? Yeah, they are the, the number of nodes that I have in the hidden layer, right? So like we said that most often what you want is to have this like cone shape, like decrease, right? I guess that 120 would be good. Okay. <laughs> so that's good. You, you could use less if you want. Like most of you're going to have less nodes. And like having less nodes means that's like it's uh, you're reducing the capacity of your model, right? So like you want this transition to be sort of gradual. Okay. But you could go even higher if you want. You could set it to 1000 and then like 1000 to 500, then like 500 to 250, 250 to 6 if you want, you know, like. But I, I decide to use 120. Because 120 is more or less half of 256, right? Sort of, yeah. yeah. I try to make this gradual change. Yeah. yeah. OK. All right. I think we get, OK, then the forward, right? So like, can anyone describe to me what's happening in the forward? So like here we have the input, which is like image space. So that's 28 by 28 by four, right? That's going to pass through the first convolutional layer, which is defined here. So I'm going to go from four channels to six channels, and then as many like uh, X and Y as it's going to result to me. I don't know yet, right? These, the, these results are going to go through the ReLU as usual, right? So like that's the activation function that I have for the first layer. And then I do the first max pooling, which is defined here, right? So like I'm going to shrink even for the resolution, okay? Then the second, same thing, right? So like now I'm in this regime where I'm going to take it from six channels to 16 channels and as many X and Y as I have at this point. Oh, hold on. My headphones are going to die. Hold on. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, good, yeah. So then as many as I have for the, uh, I sorry, yeah, I lost my train of thought. So like 16 channels for the output of the this layer, right? Now I know that I have in this output 16 channels and because I computed it like empirically, I did a print X shape, right? To see what's the shape of the output after the second convolutional layer. I saw that was, 16 times four times four. So like I, I give that as input to my first uh, fully connected, which is exactly what I'm showing here. And then just follow exactly what we have done before, like hidden to hidden, then hidden to final layer. And then the output of the final layer is the number of classes that I have. Okay, good. Any questions on that? All right, this script is exactly the same that you have seen before with a small variation because here, right, the output in the beginning uh, was a uh, number of pixels in X by number of pixels in Y by number of channels, right? I think that was the original arrangement. Let me come here very quickly. Yeah. So that, that was the way how it was organized, right? 
But now the input for the convolutional layers is slightly different because the number of channels has to come, excuse me, the number of channels has to come first, right? So like I need to do this little per permutation in the dimensions. So like now I still keep this zero because zero is the number of batches that I have, right? Which is like 1024, if you remember the way how we built the batch, right? Then I have to say that the channels are gonna come first. So like that now is dimension three, it's gonna come first. And then dimension two and dimension one. So like now I have number of batches coming first, right? Which is 1024. Then number of channels, which are four. And then X and the uh, X and Y or Y and X doesn't really matter, uh, as long as you're consistent. So that that's essentially the, the only thing that's different. And then absolutely everything else, like in this script that's going to be used for training, is just like the the things that we have seen in the first uh, part of this uh, Jupyter notebook, where we use full, uh, feed for neuronal networks to classify satellite images. Okay. So by the way. Yeah, Tar targets has to have a two device here as well. Has to have what? Sorry, uh, two uh, brackets device. Otherwise, you get the CUDA error. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 if you're using that after calculate the loss after you come exactly there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you, if you're using a device that's different from CPU, you're gonna need that definitely, yeah. Which is like a bug on my code. Good job. Very good. So everything else is exactly the same, right? The way how you compute the loss. So like the loss is still the cross entropy, right? So that we discussed in the previous lecture. And then what you want to do is to compare the distribution of like probability distribution over classes for a given input with the probability distribution of the target, which is zero everywhere, like for the other classes and one just for the actual class. That's like the true class, right? So that's the only thing that we uh, we discuss like when talking about cross entropy, okay? So now we, we exp do experiments with it, right? So like I define this set of like learning rates that I want to play with. Like I define the model that I, I'm gonna use. So the CNN net is exactly what we defined like on the, the beginning, right? The optimizer, I'm gonna use the Adam because there are several things that I like better about the Adam. For example, it ha has this adjustment of the learning rate, which I think it's really great as we discussed during optimizers, right? So like I always go for Adam, the cross entropy, that's, a, that's the laws that we're gonna use. So I feed all these uh, things that I defined here to this class train that we just discussed on the top, okay? So let's see like some performance now. Oh, I didn't plot the, the I didn't plot the losses, sorry about that. But I'm plotting like train accuracy, train loss, test loss, and test accuracy. Right, so you see that, for example, here I'm achieving train accuracy 98, right, for this data set, test accuracy 94. Let's see if I got something higher. Oh, here's already 97. Yeah, so 97 is actually the best that I got, right, with this like very simple uh, CNN. Let's see how much I did with the fully connected just using the feed forward network. So like in comparison to 97, which is the CNN, right? Let's see how much we did with the other one. Here I did 89, 94, 94 as well. Yeah, so apparently the CNN is better still by like a small margin, right? Like 97% accuracy in the test data set compared to 94 using the feed for neuronal network. So even though this is a very simple data set by using the CNN for feature extraction, right? It's still there is an improvement, even like for a data set that's simple as this one. If you go to Kaggle, like where they're, they're running the competition, you're gonna see that like my 97, it's very, very humble still, right? Like you, 
you're going to see that people are reporting borderline like 100% accuracy on these uh, satellite image data set. But they are also using like much deeper neuronal networks. They're using ResNets, right? So like it, it's, not, it, it's not a fair comparison. I'm just using like four layers <laughs> of, of neuronal network, two convolutional and like three fully connected, right? So I have way less parameters. And I already achieved like 97% because it's a very simple data set. Okay, any questions here? All right. I think the question will come when we try to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to get to explain salience map, but that's not even very important. So maybe I just skip that and I let you guys for a break so we can come back and discuss the papers. I think that's more important at this point. Yeah, so we come back at 45. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Okay, uh, about the uh, what we're going to do next. So for the second half now, uh, we're going to go over like these four papers that were suggested, right? Uh, uh, like for the people who are going to introduce the paper, the goal is just very briefly state like what they're trying to do and explain a little bit of the data set. And then I'm going to tell a little bit about how they use neuronal networks uh, to try to address that problem. And, and, and that's it. Like <laughs> we, we don't have much time to get into like much of the details of the paper. And the goal is really just to get you to uh, see how neuro machine learning or neuronal networks more specifically is being, is being used for that task, a task that hopefully you guys care about. So that, that's the only purpose of this. OK? All right. Pepe, you go first then. Okay. Um, so for the paper that uh, has been selecting is talking about global canopy height estimation with JDI LIDAR, waveform and for and Bayesian deep learning. Okay, it's a it's a yeah, it's a paper from 2022 uh, from a group from Switzerland, from uh, yes, from Switzerland, and uh, they use uh, Another product that is trying to, no, the, another product of JDI data, we use the LA, and they use another one, L1B, and they are trying to, again to regress uh, canopy eight, like we did, but not versus geographical predictors, but versus JDI waveform. Okay, so the LIDAR, the input, input of LIDAR is sending laser scanning input inputs and then it is saving this waveform so they're going to they are making a huge regression between the canopy top high and the waveform actually i have to say the truth that i've been reading this article also before the the classes of antonio and i, I completely drop it my i say okay i cannot understand this stuff so later on now today I and mean, yesterday I read it again, and I already capture a lot, a lot of more than what I, I knew before. So in particular, I try to summarize over here what they were trying to do. It. And actually, I highlight um, in, uh, in green whatever I was heard and sort of learning from Antonio. And something in, uh, in red, the stuff they still don't know. Actually, I have to say the truth that something become already green in the lecture of today. Uh, so in, in our particular method, so maybe I can I can read and we will stop word by word and try to say a few, uh, few aspects about this. So our method use deep convolution neural network and now we know what it is to regress canopy top eight, uh, can, uh, yeah, canopy height. We adapt rest net architecture that this one i think you mentioned today correct mm -hmm. but maybe you can say a few words about this one uh, i'm going to explain that on, on my slides so okay. if you want i can just take over already and then i cover that very quickly okay perfect so i can go uh, to our to our name by first replacing a two-dimensional network layers mm -hmm. with one dimensional convolutional over here, uh, it's not, it's not yeah. really clear what they did. And in particular, yeah. you mentioned network layers. 
Yeah, so the example that we did today were 2D, 2D. Uh, neuronal network layers, right? But right. you also have the 1D, where basically you have a curve, right? And then you have a filter that's defined in 1D, where you say, like, I want a curve that sort of looks like that. And then you, you do the convolution between this kernel that has this uh, shape that you can learn, right? Via defining, like, a 1D filter now, right? And you just convolve that with your uh, waveform. That's essentially what they do there. Uh, Giuseppe, I'm sorry. Is the recording started? Yeah, yeah, it's going. It's going. Yeah. Just to double check what I think is. Yeah. yeah, you see it in the upper left. There is a red button. I, saw, I was looking for it last time too. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, so now we, they have two dimensional network layers. So so, so they have two. They, they don't say how many nodes. Uh, but it's implicit on ResNet. When they say it's a ResNet, like it comes like because it's the ResNet that's defined the uh, Cayman He, the guy who wrote this paper in 2016. I'm going to show that as well. Okay, one dimension convolutional. Mm -hmm. So they use only one cube, let's say. <laughs> After the card, there was one cube. Only one, is it correct? One cube? No, in your card feature. Oh, one well. Convolution means that it is only one, so they didn't do the other step. No, it's one dimensional convolution. It says that like, it's not a conv 2D, right? The way how you're doing. Our, our filters were defining 2D, right? Like their filters are defining 1D. So it's just like a curve. It's not like a filter properly, right? It's just a curve. You convolve this curve with the waveform that you, you showed in the paper. I, I can show that. It, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, okay. This one, normalized layers, this one we know now what they are. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. uh, pooling. Okay. Pooling is the one that you. You were explained today also. You were saying the word pooling. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, more precise, our simple rest, okay, this, is the, this one consists of eight residual. This one is also, I didn't get it, eight residual blocks. What yeah, I'm going to show it now. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we just move on, Pepe. I think it's, uh, it's so we can finish all the core papers. <laughs> Capital size also, uh -huh. this is now I know. And uh, ReLU reactivation is, is uh, block included a skip connection. This one is also, I didn't get what I mean. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to show it now, John. Okay, perfect. And then something that also the model is, is going to bring is not only the regression, but also the answer time in terms of aleatoric and epistemic. I don't know if this is something if you want to add something. Okay. Yeah, I will address very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, to you. Okay, yeah. So let me go over these things. Oh. Yeah, so Pepe already introduced several things that I'm going to discuss with you guys now. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to start here, right? So for example, uh, some of the keywords that they use there, right? Like in the waveform preprocessor, they say that the waveforms are, were fixed with a maximum size. Right, so like the all the waveforms they had specifically size of like uh, uh, one thousand four hundred twenty vertical beams, and they also use padding for short waveforms. Now we know what's the padding, right? So like for the wave shorts that were is smaller than that, they add zeros at the end of the vector. So that's something that we saw today. And why is that? Because the CNN has this assumption about the size of the input, right? So like it's important for the CNN. Uh, they do this normalization, which is something that we have done like extensively, right? So like that's also something that's like you can see it's usual part of the preprocessing, which I hope you guys take like for the rest of your life. That's very important for like machine learning in general. Uh, finally, like the ResNet, right? So Pepe told you a little bit about what's the ResNet, and he was like saying, well, but they didn't define how many nodes in the layers. And, and that's because the ResNet has a specific shape overall, right? I had to rotate this image just so it would fit. But what I'm comparing here is like, what's the, a usual feed for neuronal net, uh, usually a usual 
uh, CNN. So one classic CNN is this VGG that people use quite a lot. You can see that's quite deep, right? So for example, let me try to zoom in here very quickly. Yeah. So here are the definitions of these, uh, uh, the, the layers of this VGG, right? So you can see that here's a three by three convolutional layer with output 64. So like three by three is the kernel size. Okay, so like it's a kernel size of three by three, which I have seen before. And the output is 64 channels. So like now we know that it stands for like, we have 64 filters, right? And those are 2D convolutions. Okay, because it's like all those uh, architectures, like the VGG, the ResNets, they all were designed to work with images, as you can see, image, image, and image. Okay, and then people adapt that the way how they want. So, for example, these guys in this paper, they change the 2D convolutions to 1D convolutions because their input, it's a waveform, right? So it's just like, that's a, the waveform that they use for, as input. So that's essentially what we're seeing there. So they input something that's just like a curve, right? And they want to pass that through the CNN, but the CNN expects images as inputs, not a waveform. So like they need, they had to change the type of uh, layers that are being used in the convolutional uh, network, right? Very well. So that's just to compare, that's the VGG, which like just a uh, uh, CNN, right? A very deep CNN, as you, can, as you can tell. Those are all like the layers that are, are being used by the VGG. Then you can see like where are the pool, pooling layers, right? Like pooling layer, pooling layer, and all those things now I hope you're familiar with. So one thing that uh, came on he in 2016 uh, did is that he realized that when you have very deep uh, neuronal networks, the process of like broadcasting this information to the layers might uh, result in, like a, a lot of loss of information, right? Like in the process of doing that, because as you can imagine, and probably you saw here, right? When you do a max pooling operation, you lose a lot in terms of like the resolution of the image, right? So even though the resolution is something that you, you are willing to, to lose in the process of like future extraction, right? You still want to some extent incorporate some of the information that was there originally, right? And try to steer the, direct, steer the direction of the training uh, in the best form possible. And one thing that he realized that if you combine some of the information that was in the previous layers before you do the uh, uh, like the information that was present before you do a sequence of convolutional operations, right? So that implies an addition, as you can imagine here, and is also like uh, ex uh, expressed here. If you add what was contained in the X, which is like is the inputs of that convolutional layer to the output of that sequence of conv convolutional layers that actually helps with performance overall. And that's why they, they call the skip connections that Pepe was showing on the text there. So those are all the skip connections that we're observing here, okay? So the skip connections, they're quite effective in terms of like uh, helping with the training process. And probably at some point, I'm gonna show a table that kind of compares the performance of ResNets to simple CNNs. So what they did in that paper specifically was to replace those layers that were using 2D conv by 1D convolutions, but like everything else was the same in terms of like dimensions, okay? So that's what they did in that paper. Very well. Uh, they also did something more because they also said that they implemented a simple ResNet, right? Which is like a modification to the ResNet. Uh, they replaced all the 2D uh, dimensional network layers by 1D, which we already talked about. Uh, more regular down sampling. Yeah, the simple ResNet consists of just eight residual blocks. So like, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, a bunch. So they use <laughs> they, they use just eight. Okay, so that's something. Their model is a little simpler in terms of number of residual blocks. Being a residual block, this that we're seeing here, and also what's defined here. Okay. Then what else? Then they they said that like the very last. A pooling layer is not a max pooling layer, but rather a average pooling layer. So what that means, instead of just taking the maximum value, like I showed to you guys here, instead of being just the maximum here, it would be the actual average, right? So in this case, what would be the average here? So the sum is eight, 
right? Divided by four. So like that would be two instead of four. So that's essentially what they do. So like so some people report like some benefits of doing that for different types of applications, but it's not really a setting stone like what's exactly is the best way to go. Uh, and then like for the output, they use the Rex file linear units, which is exactly what we have done before. The kernel size they kept should be three. So like no, no change there. All blocks include a skip connection that has the input of, and that's just the definition of what's a residual block, right? Which I hope you guys understood by, by this schematic here. Okay. Very well. So now about the uncertainty that Pepe was talking about. So what they did, which I think it's uh, it's very questionable, it was to train uh, like a number of CNNs that are going to process exactly the same input, but just using different uh, starting points. So like, remember that like one of the things that we're setting were the seed, right? Like for the different runs. So like in theory, because this is a stochastic process for like optimizing your network, if you, try, you start from a different seed, the way how you go down the lost landscape, right? During the optimization process might be slightly different. So like the loss function might look different. And, and their assumption here is that by changing that, you're gonna end up with completely different results, which makes me concerned for several reasons. First, that means that their model or optimizer, it's very poorly designed. Because like you shouldn't have like massive difference enough for you to say like oh I need to average all the outputs. So like I, I would, if I was the reviewer I would ask more questions about that honestly. Like that means that like you're not converging. There is no convergence in your networks, right? You you shouldn't converge so, something completely different. For example, here you're like exactly the same waveform, and like according to this schematic they would predicting that oh the the tree the canopy height could be anything going from ten to 25 that's a pretty bad model that you have there <laughs> you shouldn't have that big range you know like so I, I i yeah it's very questionable what they did here like but in any case that's what they they're proposing and then they, they say that's like yeah and then we give that as output as well what this variance that we have right which like i sh shouldn't exist in the first place like the the prediction should be changing that much as they are reporting there but anyways uh then they, they present the results like in with this classic uh, output, right? Where you do like prediction versus what was the, the reference, right? And they don't report the R value anywhere, uh, which I thought was kind of weird as well. But they, they report in terms of residuals, which apparently it's what people prefer the best, right? And then they show that the, the predicted standard deviation, the variance seems to correlate Pretty, pretty well with like the empirical root mean square of the error of the actual uh, var variability that you get like from these uh, three heights, right? Which they say it's something good, which I also disagree, but like they, they say it's uh, so that, yeah, we kind of capture the variability that you have naturally, but yeah. And that was this paper. Any questions there? Thanks, Antonio. <clears throat> they mentioned about also in understanding the uncertainty by so the uncertainty they captured by this seeding, you know, changing the seeding and running these 10, uh, 10 convolution error network and then getting mm -hmm. the among these 10. Yeah. Okay. That, that's what they call the uncertainty, right? Which I, that I would call like the poor design of their model instead <laughs> of uncertainty. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Antonio. Mm -hmm. so, so I will read again, plus your explanation. Let's see if I capture a bit more. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Point become more green. Yeah. And so on. Good. So next, we would have the convolution neuronal networks improved species distribution. So who was responsible for this one? And okay. might. Okay. Good. Can you introduce the paper? Yes. Cool. Yeah. yeah, so it's this paper. Um, so the point of the paper is that usually in species distribution models, 
uh, we use punctual data as predictors, meaning that um, we we use the environmental predictors on the point on the occurrence point of the species. Um, but here, instead of this, they use tensors that include the environmental neighborhood of the occurrence point. So by this, they are trying like this. Um, so in the mean, in the middle of the tensor, as I understand, we would have the occurrence point, and around it, all the pixels of the, the environmental space. Uh, so they're trying to capture the, the spatial structure of the environmental needs of its species. Uh, and they do it for, oops, a plant data set of many species in France uh, using climate, soil elevation, land cover uh, predictors. And then they also use uh, joint or multi-species SDMs. Um, and the output is a categorical probability distribution. That is the probability that the species occurs based that um, another species has been observed in the same location, which I haven't fully understand. Uh, so then they compare uh, convolution and neural networks SDM, punctual deep neural networks, um, boosted trees and random forest. And they find that, um, that the CNNs are much, perform much better for fewer occurrences. So for example, I was a bit blown away because they said that they, that with only one occurrence, they predicted this, distribu this distribution, and then they compared it with the actual distribution of the species based on some French environmental, I don't know, um, inventory. And it's quite similar. It just predicts in the Pyrenees as well. Anyway. Um, and then what they do is that in each Tensor, um, they I don't know. They modify the tensor in multiple ways um, to show that the spatial structure uh, of the data is meaningful or important. I don't know. And they find that the unmodified tensor per, um, yields models that perform better. Um, yeah, that's all. And oh, yeah, I actually have a couple of questions about that as well. Because like they say that, yeah, we, we perform this ablation, right? Which like, okay, if you go back to slide five, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to perform a permutation. So there is no spatial structure information. So basically you're saying that you're feeding noise and you want to see what's the performance of that noise, right? Is yeah. that a patient study at all? What if I feed in like an empty image, like with all zeros, do I expect anything meaningful from that? <clears throat> right? Which is essentially what they do there. No spatial structure, like is the mean, right? What you're showing there. It's like just an empty image. Is that but a blue I mean, study? I don't know. Sorry, but the mean, for example, it would be like if we fed a random forest with the mean elevation of the special unit. You know what I mean? If I feed in a random forest with main elevation? Yes. Yeah, not sure if I understand that. No. So we have the modeling, the special modeling units. Mm -hmm. And for each special unit, we yield the mean of the elevation across this unit. Ah, so okay. Just the as the predictor. Mm, I see. So you're re replacing all the spatial information, but just the mean elevation. So like assuming that there is homogeneous mean elevation. Yes, or the mean and standard deviation. <laughs> okay. Okay. That, that's a bit better than I, than I thought. It, it's still pretty bad, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
but for example, some of the things that we, I was uh, discussing earlier with uh, Jitski, right? Uh, she, she was asking about argumentations, right? So for example, uh, one of the argumentations that they are doing here, is, as you can observe, it's uh, the rotation, right? So what they are trying to investigate, if, if I rotate uh, the uh, spatial information, if that is still like a strong predictor, right? Do they report the results for that? What happens after they do the rotation? Yes, they do. Um, somewhere. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I mean, they, they have the same the same graph as this one, but mm -hmm. for the different ablation. For the different ablation, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Yes. Okay, let me see if I find that here very quickly. Uh, can it be convolution neuronal networks? Oh, yeah, I think I found it. Central rotation, yeah. Can I share my screen? Yes. Okay. Here, right? So like that's the the different uh, argumentations that they are doing, right? The mean, mm -hmm. the the standardization, the rotation, right? So like, as you can see the rotation, uh, is there a way to zoom out from this thing? But like the rotation with the black one, right? So like doing the, the rotation apparently didn't break anything. And which I think it's very intuitive, right? The, the rotation shouldn't necessarily break anything because in the end of the day, what you're doing is just like rotating the spatial information that you have. And for example, the, this spatial information is encoding something with respect to uh, how that environment might be in favor for like a species to uh, live in that region, right? So like the, the simple rotation should not necessarily disrupt all this combination of factors that are like, in favor of uh, like let a species to thrive in that environment, right? So I think it makes perfect sense that it doesn't break anything. And in that case, if you do this rotation, you could be augmenting your data set because now instead of just having uh, this type of environments, right? You could like have several rotations of these. You'd have like, let's say that you do uh, 10 rotations, these light rotations, right? So like you'd have like 10 samples out of this single one that also encodes similar uh, probability of like uh, a species of occurring that location, right? So that might be adventurous. That's a definitely argumentation you could do. Okay, so let, let me go to the methods in this paper. Right, so some of the things that they discussed there already, right? So like, for example, uh, she already explained about how they are using this spatial environment in Tensor, right? Uh, and try to use that to do this prediction of uh, species occurring there. She already explained about how you're, they're going to take this uh, information as being like what's surrounding, what's the neighborhood of a single location, right? Perhaps the one thing that uh, I, I could add there is like what's the model that they're using, right? So like they are still using a CNN-based model, but the difference is that uh, we have seen what's the CNN, like the VGG was one of the methods, right? That's like a typical CNN that's used for image classification nowadays. We saw the ResNet, which was the method that was used by the canopy height uh, model, right? And now we are seeing one more that's the inception net. So the inception net, as you, if you compare those two here, let me see if I have one that includes the ResNet. Yeah, okay, great. Let me try to zoom in. So like, Yeah, so that's the ResNet, right? So like here you see all the residual blocks that we saw before, right? Uh, the, and now compare this structure of the, the ResNet to the structure of the inception net, right? So you see that you have way more parallel paths happening in the inception net. So like here we have the usual 
uh, three by three convolutional layer, right? That's very similar to what people do in the ResNet. Like you start with convolutional layers and then you go down like with these skip connections. But here on the inception net, you, you actually have like three parallel paths, right? That they use a different combination of layers. So for example, in this one path, you just have one convolutional layer. In this other one path, you have like two convolutional layers, but with different kernel size. So this one had like a, a kernel size one. So like you're just like trying to extract information from single pixels, right? And this one you like do single pixels and then like a kernel size of five. So like a set of five by five pixels, right? And then you have like one more stream here that use kernel size one by one, then three by three and three by three again. And then all this information is co concatenated here to do like one big filter, okay? And then you go to the next inception net. So that's the, what the inception net does. They, they increase like streams of information, right? Which is something that people have been doing a lot nowadays. And you're gonna see something similar to uh, Sebastian paper like in a little bit, okay? So you just have more streams of information. One thing that's like, although it looks more complex overall, actually, if you compare the, the size of those kernels, they're actually smaller because you see like this kernel is just one scalar, right? It's a one by one. So I'm just, I just have a constant that's uh, multiplying a pixel basically, right? So like you're actually saving number of parameters that we have overall, which was like a pretty insightful uh, thing that people have done. So for example, this is the comparison of like number of parameters that you have for those different methods, right? So like number of parameters implies number of weights that you have. So you see that the ResNet, like this is a really big ResNet. It's a ResNet with 152 residual blocks, right? It had performance 95, the inception, right? And, and this ResNet had like uh, 60.3 million parameters. So like millions of weights, right? So like the inception had just 6.4, 10 times smaller, right? The number of like weights you need to train and had like 90, 93% of accuracy, right? So like you see that like, yeah, you can sacrifice number of parameters, right? Without sacrificing accuracy. So that's a pretty good insight that they had there. The inception net, by the way, was designed by Google. So just so, so you guys know. And uh, then they like few other details about the uh, this the training that they use for these species uh, probability uh, classification. There they use cross entropy there. Uh, like I, I think it's because they are inferring probability distribution over an area, right? So like you have probability distribution over area. So it's not a simple uh, regression because you still have probability distribution. And if you're trying to match probability distribution, we have seen before that like the loss function that you use should be cross entropy, right? So like that's why it's cross entropy still. Uh, interesting details that they are using stochastic gradient. So like that, that's something that we saw that like usually it has several disadvantages, but they still decide to use that one. Uh, and then they use like different number of epochs to do this kind of training, right? Um, like I think they use momentum. Ah, yeah, here. So they use dropout, as you can see as well, which we have seen that's a pretty cool technique in order to try to uh, ensure that you have like homogeneous usage of all the input features that you have. And they use momentum as well. You guys remember what momentum is for? It's to prevent you getting stuck in local minimums, which most likely is what's happening to these guys that's why they have such different <laughs> the different uh, outputs for the same network they're, they're most likely getting stuck in local minimums that's why you have like such different outputs okay what, what else about this one would you be able to repeat the results with this um information most likely yeah like so it uh, seems to be complete yeah, they, they give all the information that you need pretty much. Like if you're not gonna be able to replicate 100%, because there is always like small details here and there, but at least the method is very clear what they have done. So I think they did a pretty good job there. And yeah, I think Can that's you explain it. Mm -hmm. just the, the momentum, uh, where is that used when we have the stochastic gradient descent? It's, yeah. It's not involved, is it? or? Where is it involved? I was a bit confused now. 
So that was the stochastic gradient of momentum, right? So you remember that's like- I have like, a good moment. Ah, okay. I thought you didn't have it, but yeah. No, yeah. I'm mixing Here up. Have some, yeah. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. So the, the momentum helps you to uh, uh, like tame these big oscillations. Yeah, that have yeah in the I remember. I just didn't remember we had it with the STG. I thought it was this, this the Adam and that, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Good, any questions there? So, and, and then they, uh, Aphrodite already showed this uh, performance, right? So they show that the CNN seems to be the one that gives the best accuracy, like uh, for, for the prediction compared to like other approaches. So I think uh, BT is bootstrap with something that people use quite a lot. RF is random forest and DNN, I think it's a fully connected uh, layer. So like just a simple neuronal network, okay? Uh, good. So next in my list, I have the deep map, map prediction. Uh, that was Sebastian's, right? Right. Okay, cool. Can I share my screen? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Um... Yeah, the depth map prediction from a single image using whatever. Um, so the depth map here means that we have an image and uh, we want to know the distance from the camera focal point of view to the pixel. So you see on the right is the depth map. Here, every gray value represents a certain distance. Yeah, and my motivation to uh, to suggest this paper was actually a much more complicated paper related to my field. Here you see a, a satellite image of, of, of an area of Mars. You see craters and little hills and different albedo values. And uh, these guys, they are able to estimate the DTM, in fact, um, just from this single image. And this, is, this paper was actually, I was first thinking of suggesting this paper, or this would be my wish, but uh, it's much more complicated than I thought. It would probably have been outvoted. So that's why I chose a paper, this other paper, where, where, the, where this work is based on. But it's, yeah, the very basic of that paper, would, which I actually want to understand. So first I have to understand the basic paper, and then one day I might understand this one. So um, just uh, to, to introduce you to the, to the, to the subject, usually uh, digital terrain models, we all know, know it from, from remote sensing, are uh, created by stereo imagery. That's the most common, commonly used uh, technique. So you have two images from a different uh, point of view, and then by geometric um, yeah, construction, you can you can uh, construct this object point in your in your image and and derive the the height of that uh, point. And uh, ob um, obviously, uh, this has been done already using um, image estimation, um, depth estimation from a single image. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. One one thing I have uh, I forgot to mention here. Um, when you do this, you have usually these images have some certain resolution. And uh, the, the height resolution is usually a third uh, of the precision of the image resolution. Yeah? And uh, what these guys do here, they are able to, to estimate the height um, with the same resolution as the single image, which is quite impressive. Yeah? So these techniques are related to um, also super resolution restoration, it's called. So they, they have a low resolution image. And because they have learned their network so well, they can create a higher resolution image from that low resolution image. So that's really scary in a way. Um, so uh, back to the topic. So this paper I suggested here, they are able to do this um, depth estimation on, on yeah, regular objects like we saw before, image libraries. Um, and they are used for 3D modeling, physics modeling, robotics. And, and such things as autonomous, autonomous drivers, so driving. So every Tesla has these things built in nowadays so that the car can estimate how far the object is away and to measure things. If you want to measure things on a single image, you need to know the distance of the respective object in that image. Otherwise you can't um, uh, get the scale. 
So, and here they actually describe their major challenge. Usually um, the, they can estimate the, the death um, or the previous studies could estimate the, guess, uh, the death, but um, they have a very high uncertainty in scale. And that's obviously the problem. And say introduce some thing called scale invariant error um, to, to get rid of that challenge. And what they do direct regression on the depth with two components. Actually, I have assembled these slides when I didn't know anything about convolutional networks, so it's probably stupid what I wrote here. And yeah, that's they describe how they they do it. So, and then uh, I want to show you the data sets because that was a request from from Antonio. So there are obviously two um, data sets where they where images are delivered together with their depth. So that's the, the training data set. So we know already the, the depth. Um, the first data set is the New York University depth. Um, it's some indoor scenes uh, as videos from a Microsoft Connect. So uh, the Microsoft Connect can, when, when you do video recording with it, it has two cameras and it can record uh, RGB, Im RGB images and depth together. And that's, that's delivered in this data set. You can download it here. And the other one is the Kitty uh, data set, the Vision Benchmark suit, and it has, has uh, outdoor scenes um, from, from car-mounted cameras together with a, with a LiDAR scanner, actually. And it consists of 56 scenes from city, residential, and road area, and they are split into uh, some things. And yeah, it has some, some parameters. And actually, here is the... the, the the paper now, the, their model, and yeah, they, they have a, a two-fold network, so they, they do um, somehow two, um, yeah, they, they build two networks and combine them. So first they, they create a, a coarse depth net, and, and this is more precise because they use a full image. So this is more precise in, in terms of, of the scale, so to, to compensate for their, what they describe as their challenge. And then they they have um, a, a fine uh, fine lo uh, local network where they um, compute patches of that course model and then they combine it somehow and 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 get the the fine result mm -hmm. so combined with the course and so they they get the they over can overcome this um, this this scale problem somehow and yeah that's, mm -hmm. I, I wrote down some stuff also some stuff from but probably Antonio can can explain that yeah I, I can go over the explain that better yeah the remain detail okay so take yeah, over okay. please that's pretty good yeah yeah thank you let me share mine now yeah I I think uh, the Sebastian already cover most of the details, right? So like, I think the, the starting point for me would be here already where uh, I explain the, the model that they are using. So first of all, that, that's the paper that is the motivation. I think it's really interesting. Eh? I, 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 we should discuss that one because the, that model, uh, that's it's like the, getting the, the depth of like in the moon surface, right? Mars. I, I, but Mars, yeah. okay, yeah. They applied also to moon also. Yeah, already, uh, yeah. yeah I, I imagine yeah so they, they use two methods that i would love to talk about with degenerative adversarial networks right so like they generate new samples and they also use unit which is like if you have uh, realized so far like when you're doing these operations right for example after you have a max pooling right a pooling operation from a set of like four pixels right for uh, values you get one for example right when you're doing a two by two kernel correct and once you do that there is no way to go back right you cannot like up sample again like do the reverse operation because like that information is lost in that moment so one thing that people use to try to like get the best of both words is to record which operate like what was lost in the image in, in that specific operation, right? And that's essentially what the UNet does. That's why you're able to retrieve not just the original resolution of the image, but even upscale that because you keep recording absolutely every, every operation that you do in your uh, your network. So like that's a property that of the UNet that you show in your slide as well. So like that that's a really cool technique that they're using there. I've, I'll be interested to, to see the, the full paper later. 
uh well yeah so like as Sebastian explains, they have, they have two streams of processing, right? So like they have this coarse level and they call the refined level. Uh, the coarse level gets the whole image as input, right? Which, uh, so just like Sebastian said, and then they do the sequence of like convolutional operations like until here. So by now you're very familiarized with what's happening, right? So you have this kernel size of five by five. Uh, here, let's start here. The kernel size is 11 by 11. Which is very similar to what they do in the image net as well, if you recall. And you see that the number of filters that they're using is also 96. Which like I was very suspicious until here, right? Like I was like, ah, there is exactly what the image net did. And then I think somewhere in the paper they say that they use image net as like a starting point. I was like, ah, okay. So they, they you say that they are using image net. I, I think I didn't write anywhere here. But they use image net as the starting point. So already they give those filters as like the uh, the initial state of the mode, and then you just do fine tuning on the on those, like in order to have a better, uh, more accurate prediction, right? Uh, well, the output of their mode. So then you have like these fully connected layers here, right? The output of their model looks like this. So like it's this coarse level prediction, where like the points that are in white, they will be the furthest away, and black the closest, right? So what they do in the second step is this refined prediction where now they don't use the full image as input. I think they say somewhere that they use a smaller size. Uh, where do they say that? I think it's like 40, 45 pixels by 45 pixels. I, I didn't write it down. So like the, the users the starting point like different chunks of the image, right? So like now you do these operations, but very localized. And because you're doing that very localized, you, you can use the smaller uh, kernel size and stride, as you can see, which like by uh, nature of how the convolution operation is done, grants you like more resolution overall, right? And then if you do that by chunk segments of the image, you have an output that's more refined in terms of details. And more than that, they also use the information that came from the course per processing. So you see that's like, here, the output, or I mean, the number of uh, channels that we had, right, were like 63 filters, right? Then they concatenate with this one, which gives you like 64, you see? And then you go on on the processing. And then you retrieve something that looks like that, which is like way better resolution. So it's a pretty clever approach what they are doing there. Uh, then they like some of the details, right? So like they use this uh, like max pooling as like some of these, uh, like in, in between the, the layers and two fully connected layers. Uh, all the hidden layers, they say that they use rectifier linear units. So you see that that's very recurrent. Everybody used that as like a usual approach. Uh, the dropouts up, is apply only to the fully connected hidden layer, like the, the like in the very few uh, layers that you have there. Uh, and uh, here, they didn't say exactly what was the size. It just said that's like, yeah, the, the fine scale network only receives a portion of the image. But uh, those are just other details in general. Uh, Sebastian uh, very briefly commented about the, the way how they solve this problem by modifying the type of laws that's being used, right? So instead of like the usual mean square, mean square error that you would like expect, right? That would just say like, oh, my predicted depth is this and compared to my ground truth. Like then I just try to optimize on that. So they realized that that there was a trick that they could use, which they call the scaling variant mean square, which just takes the log of all of that. And apparently that seems to be helpful for them. I would love to see more details about how they came to this conclusion. <laughs> but like it's, apparently that already boosts like the performance of the model. Uh, and yeah, they, they impose one more constraint if you look at this. So like they say that not just the overall prediction, right, has to match, but also there is one more constraint, which like that neighboring pixels, right? They should also have like similar uh, depth, which like uh, makes a lot of sense, like for the, uh, given the problem that you have in your hands, right? Like neighbor regions in the image, they, they can't have like very dis big discrepancies in terms of like depth. So if you can impose that through constraint, it might be helpful for like learning overall. And, and that's the, the, cool, the, the very important message for like deep learning in general, is that most often it comes down to finding the proper way of describing the problem that you're trying to optimize. And they did a pretty good job here overall. And that's like some of the results that they report, right, for the different data sets. So like you can see that the, the prediction is really, really nice. Uh, 
actually C is the output and D is the ground truth. So like that's the output of their model and that's the ground truth. So you can see a lot of details that were properly captured, I would say. Yeah. It's a nice paper, yeah. They, it's cited 2,800 times, so. Yeah, I mean, they, they did a good job there. It's a, it's a really interesting paper overall, yeah. And like being able to do the depth estimation from a single image, like not having the stereo vision, it's a, it's a real big problem for robotics as well. So I think they, it, yeah, it's a very important topic overall. Cool, and then do we have time for one more or do we have to stop? You wanted to do some closing, right, Pepe? Maybe we stop here okay. then. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Unfortunately, we just managed to cover three papers, but just so I can I can fi finalize this, like I, I hope you can appreciate that. Like you see that most of the things that these papers, like even these big ones, like this one that we just discussed now, right? Like cited like hundreds of times. They use techniques that now you know very well how they work, right? So like it's nothing else than just using convolutional neural layers, right, to extract information, followed by like fully connected layers and then you can do really interesting stuff with that so yeah and now you can read those papers knowing what they mean right so i think that's like in the end that was the goal of this course is like uh, make life easier for you to now be able to google like solutions for your problems right so i hope it helps yeah thanks antonio for this wonderful uh, lecture Five lectures, really intense in machine learning, and this one closing up. Uh, I want to spend a few words about uh, what I hope you learned so far. So we have in the course, as you can, see, as you could see, there are two main components about uh, the geo computation and the modeling part, and both of, both of them have been strengthened in terms of capacity to understanding how to to process this data set for the geo computation part with the most efficient tools and also to prepare the data because um, to prepare the data for ingesting side to the machine learning. So to, to Antonio, we have done a data set that they were already clean, they were crooked and so on. But before to arrive to the table, there is a big part of geo computation that is not something that uh, sometimes is easier. Sometimes easier, some, especially when you work in a in a big in a big scale of data set at global level and so on. So try to to enforce as much as possible this learning phase by yourself. Going back to the to the lecture, we will leave it open the the recording. So to to rush up, I will transfer everything to the to the YouTube rather than Zoom. Uh, but the link will be then then again um so keep keep going back in lecture and there are also lectures from previous time so you can also screaming there are lectures from grant for grass how to use grass for the geo computation part uh, there are lectures also uh, how to use the multi uh, high performance computing for sending job with the queue system in the in the web in, yes in the in the special ecology site that we were using uh, so for example in particular these one are on the tier web seminar uh, talks okay there are these talks are really talks but then there is one that is seminar web seminar over here so this one the digital ogr is the one that we cover it up but the grass and geo computation with the performance computing is the one uh that i suggest to use especially if you are using the hpc and then because this one is also good to link hook up with the with the machine learning that Antonio was was mentioned because so far we have been using the virtual machine that has his low, low limitation you know it was good for teaching and so on but then when you need to apply for big data set um, is getting is, is getting limited okay so uh, then I want to say a few words also about uh, the final um, uh, the final um the final uh, work that you have to prepare for the week in, in Matera or online so the, the week in Matera again is between 13 and 17 of June everything is booked in the universities so feel free to come and please send me your heads up if you didn't 
um, because I need to count how many we are to getting also all the past to the university and so on. Um, so in terms of for the final project over here, you can see the one from, uh, from Sweden from last year, okay? Uh, so just pick up one uh, in particular, you can see that there are um, part of the code writing, you know, and um, yeah, part of the writing and parting of the code. Then, uh, so there is a bit of geo computation, some machine learning, then plotting and so on. So try to do in the same way. This is nothing else that a Jupyter lab, a Jupyter lab notebook. So this is what I want, what we want for the final project, a Jupyter notebook. Then when you are going to present, because you are going to have just 10, 15 minutes to present because we are 26, so we will be quite a lot. Uh, 15 minutes to present another 15 minutes of question. And we, you will scroll in down and explain in chunk, of course, not line by line, what you did and what you perform, what you, you achieve, okay? Try always to have the geo computation part and the machine learning part. And, uh, and this, especially this one, is the homework compulsory to the, to the final um, diploma, let's say, that will be released after the presentation. So uh, we are going to send also a calendar with the people that are presenting each day. We will start the presentation probably by Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we will give uh, the, I mean, we will organize between the people that are in Matera and the people that are online. If some people are really on the, on the side of the world that is completely night, they can record it, and then we will watch the recording later on. Okay, so this one again is compulsory to the presentation and uh, is compulsory to the diploma and the, the Jupyter notebook. Um, so that's it from my side. Maybe uh, Tushar want to say a few words about the closing up and the, the survey that we are going to, to give to you. Thanks, Giuseppe. And uh, thank you all for being part of this year's very diverse cohort. The, the last two years were challenging for special ecology to say the least uh, we had to change the format and the syllabus and bring most of it online uh, which wasn't such a bad thing because uh, the data environment is uh, rapidly evolving across all disciplines and as a small group uh, special ecology is able to learn about and quickly deploy the the little latest uh, tools and techniques to analyze this data so uh, machine learning is a case in point. We were able to uh, offer you uh, a, a far more extended uh, insight into that uh, compared to what we can do typically in a one week format, uh, which we've been doing in, in recent years. So um, equally, it's uh, encouraging that there are scientists, engineers, and researchers such as yourselves uh, who recognize the trem tremendous potential behind uh, open source programming. So thank you for your dedication and your perseverance through these weeks. Um, towards the end of the course, uh, every course, we run a survey, as Giuseppe mentioned, um, where attendees can anon anonymously submit their uh, critiques, recommendations, uh, feedback. Uh, um, so we request you to to share this with us. Uh, we'll be sending out a link shortly and would really appreciate your, your honest uh, insight, feedback. Thank you. Okay, thanks to Shar for this last word. And um, yeah, that, that's it for us. I mean, we will keep supervising, uh, we will keep supervising uh the work i mean if you have question about your final project that janus will say that we of course during this week we are um we are monitoring i mean you you, you are you're going to work and please don't rush up in the last moment to asking everything saturday night before to arrive to, to matera because if not we cannot reply so start already to to to, to produce some jupiter lab already from now and uh, yeah, if you have any question about uh, Matera, we will be organized, feel free to ask now and we will do a detailed syllabus on, uh, on this coming days. Anyway, it's going to be from Monday to Friday, from nine to five. Okay, over from my side, if you have any question. 
Yes, Bast. Uh, I have a question about what's going on in Matera. So we, we choose this project by ourselves or uh, so we can decide what we are working yes, on. Yes, yes, or... several times. Feel free. Yeah, yeah, feel free to pick up any 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 field that you want um, concerning your. It, it, much better if you do select something that you you are really interested. If you really cannot, because anyone do not have an idea, get the same tree height, you know, and adding more uh, more environmental layers, and then try all the technique of convolution neural network, this rust rest net that Antonio was explaining today. So all these kind of aspect but feel free to use any data so the first step would then be to introduce that problem and if it's if it at all makes sense probably right y yes we are scientists so we need to do something that <laughs> that has a meaning no but i i don't know if 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 i will if um, if i will, if it's not too much too far away or too too big the problem and yeah, try to yes, of course, try to 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 summarize. There are some over here that they were they are extremely long. So try to summarize something that you can explain also in, in 15 minutes. You know, don't 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 come with your, your full PhD thesis over here. Okay, there, there are some already is like a sample uh, project or yeah, in the Sweden. Okay, for the Sweden yeah. part. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So over here you can see some of them that they, they were very long, but some other they are you know they are in line also because you need to explain in 50 days try to have something between that cover the job computation part and also the uh, the modeling part if there is no any machine learning but there is another technique uh, i don't know even knn uh, that we didn't explain it's also fine you know uh, it's important that we see the the use of the tools and and the science behind also and be aware that we will be not expert in your specific field. So you have to come up with a, an interesting uh, research question. And then, of course, if you cannot reach 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, but 0 0.2, doesn't matter. It's important that you do it and maybe you explain why. So, uh, and how do we communicate with the Slack if we are yes, remotely attending? Open. Yeah, yeah. Slack will be still open okay. until ending of materials. Yeah. Okay, cool. Any other question in this line, this contest? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so are you, is it okay that we still just continue to do the project on the virtual machine or do you expect us to kind of process a lot of uh, more data for bigger areas or? No, 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 it's important. It's, it's fine if you're doing the virtual machine, but you, you were already asked me, it's very slowly, it's very slow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so first of all, I mentioned in the for everybody in the Slack. Uh, so if you see the uh, GSK question, so before to start the the virtual machine, you under setting general or system general, you can set how many CPU you want to use it because as a default, you're using only one. Uh, when I was explaining XARG, probably most of you passed to two CPU, but if not, uh, do it now. And, and again, a virtual machine, you are sharing your memory with, uh, with another, uh, with your, with the two operating systems. So of course, if your laptop is already eight, you have already very limited RAM to use it. If you have more than eight, then it's fine. If not, then the, the, the solution is working a supercomputer or working a desk, but again, make a small data set, it doesn't matter. It's important that you, you do the coding and you try to do the techniques, okay? Can you maybe just uh, post the XARG command again in Slack? Because I don't, or remind uh, us where we find it at least. Yeah, it's always, <laughs> it's, yeah everything is on the web. <laughs> it's yeah, I know. <laughs> Multicore bash, yeah, it is one. Yeah, okay. Multicore bash, yeah. Okay, so over there is where uh, we use the first time that we use multi-core. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, any, any other question? 
Okay, seems no. Okay, so good luck with uh, with your work. I hope all the best, and uh, we will keep chatting between us in uh, in Slack. And always, especially if there are coding related topics, open open question, not direct only to me or to Antonio, but more related because sometimes it's also dependent on the time zone. Somebody reply before than us. Okay, so this is quite important to build the community. Okay, so for the one that are uh, coming to Matera, see you in Matera, and uh, if not, to see you online again. And in Matera, I'm going to have a short talk of the, the lecture will be not many, like one hour or two hours every day. The rest, the rest will be hackathon. So we will supervise in Antonio's coming, so we will supervise in uh, the student there, and also we will have a Zoom section open in this way someone can jump in and ask him, we can do it, okay? It, it, of course, it will be not so easy for the people on, online, but we are doing, we will do our best. 